Welcome to this video from Learn Electrics. We've often been asked, why do we calculate prospective fault current in three phase systems the way that we do? A question might be, just what is three phase PFC? Or, why do we multiply some numbers by two and other numbers by the square root of three? And, if it is three phase, then why do we measure single phase? We can begin by looking at Appendix 14 in the wiring regulations, as this is where it all starts. You will find this on page 504, and the two important sentences are highlighted. The first sentence of interest is about a short between two of the line conductors. We can calculate the approximate prospective fault current, the PFC, by first measuring between line and neutral, and then multiplying this number by the square root of 3, which is 1.73. The second sentence considers a short between all three line conductors at the same time, and it tells us to calculate the fault current by taking the line to neutral value and then multiplying this number by 2. Why do we measure single phase first? A line to neutral measurement of the prospective short circuit current or PSCC is made because most multifunction testers will not measure three phase fault currents. So we measure at 230 volts and then multiply by certain numbers to arrive at the 400 volt three phase answer. Remember that these are live tests and suitable precautions must be taken and safe working practiced. So we must calculate the approximations, the three phase values based on what we know about three phase and its relationship to single phase. If we have a quick recap on single phase, this will help our understanding of three phase. In a single phase waveform, the voltage will peak at 230 volts positive above the neutral point and then peak at 230 volts negative below it. There are 50 cycles per second, often referred to as 50 hertz. One cycle of single phase is 20 thousandths of a second. And so it goes on, cycle after cycle. The voltage will vary between plus 230 volts and minus 230 volts, with a positive and negative peak in each full cycle. Now we can look at three phase waveforms and compare these to single phase. There are three phases or waveforms now, just like single phase. The three phases, L1, L2, L3, are shown here with the older and still used colours of red, yellow and blue. More modern installations will use brown, black and grey. Each phase will be 120 degrees apart, since 3 into 360 degrees is 120. Notice that two phases cannot peak at the same time. If one phase is at a positive or negative peak, then the other two phases cannot be at a peak. So what will all these voltages be? First, we need to know that in a mathematical sense, all the plus voltages and all the minus voltages add up to zero. Let me explain. Look at the purple line on this drawing. At that moment in time, the red phase is at the same voltage as the neutral or zero point. The yellow is at plus 200 volts and the blue at minus 200 volts. Add these together, plus 200 minus 200 is zero volts. It will always follow this mathematical rule for voltage. Here, the red is at plus 115 volts and so is the yellow, which means that the blue must be at minus 230 volts. Plus 115, plus 115, minus 230 is zero again. Remember this, we will do something completely different in a moment. Now we can look at the calculation involving root 3 and discover why we use this number. We're going to look at just two phases now, and there are rules to follow. The maximum difference between two phases is 400 volts. We're now looking at how far apart electrically the voltages can be. Say, for example, that the blue phase was at plus 230 volts, and the red phase at minus 170 volts. Then how far apart are they? 
from neutral, the blue is 230 volts in one direction and the red is 170 volts in the opposite direction. Now we can lay these out end to end and we can see that between the two phases, in this example, there is 400 volts difference. For a 230 volt system, this is the maximum voltage difference between any two phases. And if we take 230 volts and multiply it by the square root of 3, we will get 400 volts. Or multiply 230 by 1.73 and we will get the same answer, 400 volts. The square root of 3 is in fact 1.73. Now, let's make this into a current. We can measure the prospective short circuit current at the distribution board. The line to neutral voltage is 230 volts and let's say that the loop resistance is 0 0.3 ohms. Using Ohm's law, voltage divided by resistance will give us current. So 230 volts divided by 0 0.3 ohms comes to 767 amps or thereabouts. This would be a single phase fault current, the PSCC. The regulations book tells us that to arrive at a three phase fault current, we should multiply the single phase line to neutral current value by root 3. We have just measured what it will be at 230 volts. Now we want to know what the fault current will be at 400 volts. So, 767 amps multiplied by root 3 or 1.73 will come to 1,328 amps. This is our fault current if there is a short between two phase conductors in a three phase system in this example. So what have we found out? In a three phase system, the fault current that might flow during a short circuit between two of the conductors is the line to neutral current multiplied by the square root of 3 or 1.73. In our example, 767 amps multiplied by 1.73 is 1,328 amps. Time to look at the number 2 now. Be patient with this one, it will make sense very soon. The worst case scenario would be a short circuit between all three phase conductors. Perhaps a nail between L1, L2 and L3 as shown here. What is the worst case fault current that can flow? We said before that when one phase is at plus 230 volts, then the other two phases must add up to minus 230 volts. In this example, red is at plus 230. Yellow is at minus 170 and blue sits at minus 60. This time we are not going to cancel things out. We are going to stack them up one after the other. We have red at plus 230 above neutral, yellow is at 170 below neutral and then blue at minus 60. How far apart are the top and bottom of the column? One half is at 230 positive and the other half is 230 negative. Now calculate the currents using the same 0 0.3 ohms as before. 230 divided by 0 0.3 is 767 amps flowing in the positive direction. 170 divided by 0 0.3 is 567 amps in the negative direction. And lastly, 60 divided by 0 0.3 is 200 amps also in the negative. How much current is flowing? 767 plus 567 plus 200 is 1,534 amps. 1,534 amps is the same as 2 times 767. For a short across all three of the phase conductors at the same time, measure the single phase live to neutral fault current between live and neutral and then multiply by 2. Easy. Finally, which value are we to write on our electrical certificate? Look at this little table as we continue with our example. Which prospective fault current shall we enter on the paperwork? It must always be the worst case values. 
If our installation can handle the worst case, then anything less than that should be OK too. Follow the table through to the rightmost column and you can see that we have two values of fault current, 1,328 amps and 1,534 amps. Here we should enter 1,534 amps as the three-phase prospective fault current. A brief summary then. Most multifunction test meters will not test three-phase PFC directly. So, in order to calculate the correct PFC to record on the electrical certificate, we must carry out a live to neutral loop test, PSCC, just as you would for a single phase circuit. We will do three tests and write down the results for comparison. L1 to neutral, L2 to neutral and L3 to neutral. Then we choose the highest value from the L1, L2, L3 tests. Multiply this highest value by root 3 or 1.73 and also multiply it by 2. Record the highest of these numbers on the electrical certificate which is usually the times 2 value. And do remember these tests are performed on a live circuit. Always work safely at all times. Thank you for watching this video. It is very much appreciated. Please subscribe to our channel to get access to all of our videos and remember to click on notify to be sure of not missing our next video. Here are some tips on getting even more information and help out of learnelectrics.com. At your web browser, enter learnelectrics.com into the search bar, select learnelectrics.com from the choices offered and the website, as shown, will open up for you. You now have a couple of choices. You can search for a help item or any video by entering a keyword into the search bar on the right. Click on return and all the help files and videos with that word in the title will be listed for you. They will be shown with a short description and each video listed will have a link shown that will take you directly to that exact YouTube video. Or you can browse through a list of all the available items and videos. To do this, click on the LE logo on the top left of the home page and all of our items and videos will be shown. There will be 10 items shown on each page and at the bottom of each page is a page selector, page 2, page 3, page 4, etc. that will bring up the next 10 items or videos in the list. And don't forget that you can also type in Learn Electrics, all one word, into the YouTube search bar to go directly to our channel at any time from any computer. We are constantly adding new videos to our channel. Don't miss the next one. And once again, thanks for watching and we hope to see you again very soon.